All right, we're going to talk about congenital femoral deficiency. So these are the, um, the classification systems um, that include the more severe congenital femoral deficiencies, Hamanichi, Pappas, and Aitken. Um, uh, they're descriptive, but don't really help you understand how to treat. Gillespie's was very practical. Three main groups, A and B reconstructable, C probably not reconstructable. And then Paley's, um, uh, the attempt here was to, um, was to demonstrate that if you have the type 1s, you've got an intact femur. So if you realign it, you can um, expect a reasonably good hip and the opportunity to lengthen in a stable environment. Type 2 is an established pseudarthrosis. And the point here was, if you're going to consider lengthening that, you've got to do a large reconstruction around that hip, which was the origin of the super hip, right? So um, here's a, um, the mild deformity, uh, Gillespie A or Paley 1A. There, there is no genetic predisposition uh, that we know about. Um, the discrepancy is somewhere around 20 to 30 percent of the femur, and uh, the foot's usually at the mid tibia. And it's always retroverted. There's always genuvalgum. And there's usually associated um, fibular hemimelia. The coxivera here is very distinct in that it's not a progressive type of coxivera. Um, and um, uh, there is usually a cruciate ligament deficiency. So the management of these milder types depends on the predicted discrepancy at maturity. So if it's a very mild discrepancy, you might use a shoe lift or do an epiphysiodesis. If it's more severe, four to five centimeters or greater, you're going to consider reconstruction. And if there's an abnormal hip, if there's any dysplasia, you have to reconstruct that hip to lengthen that femur. So this was an example of a child I did a long, long time ago, and it, it amazes me to this day. Uh, the child had a T young man had a typical congenitally short femur, eight centimeters short, and I put a frame on him and he disappeared for months. And when he came back, he was eight centimeters longer with a straight leg and uh, walking around without any problem. And so I took the fixator off and <laughs> there he is. So I'll never get an eight centimeter femoral lengthening in a congenitally short femur like this again. So this is a more typical story. So this uh, child was, um, um, was born with a congenital short femur and fibular hemimelia. And here she is at three weeks, four centimeters. You could use the multiplier right here, but I'm just going to show you um, the thinking that goes along with these cases. Two plus six, five plus six. And here we see on the Mosley chart, if you plot it out, the predicted discrepancy at maturity is going to be about 18 centimeters. So you know this is going to be a significant reconstruction. So at five, we did a femoral lengthening and extended the frame across the knee to stabilize the knee. Um, she had significant AP instability. And here she is with a six centimeter fibular, uh, femoral lengthening. Um, she's in valgus. Here she is close to eight and a half. So I treated the valgus with an eight plate. And, um, and here, a tibial lengthening. Um, we only achieved four centimeters um, because she developed a flexion um, a contracture of the knee. And um, so here she is with a four centimeter tibial lengthening. We're slowly getting closer. 11 and a half, um, I had to repeat the growth modulation and uh, did a left distal femoral epiphysiodesis went on to a femoral lengthening of five centimeters, um, pretty well aligned at the end of the femoral lengthening. Here we are, we should be within two to three centimeters. But we're off a little. This girl has a greater residual discrepancy than we had planned for, and um, uh, had recurrent valgus deformity. 
So right now we're in the process of doing a tibial uh, lengthening and realignment. Here's a similar child, similar mild to moderate deformity, but with coxivera and hip dysplasia. So you know you're going to need to treat that hip if you want to lengthen that femur. This child has already had a, um, a tibial lengthening. And so I did a valgus derotation osteotomy and a DEGA, and pretty nice result. Um, you know, a little loss there, but pretty good. And that allowed us to go on to do a uh, femoral lengthening, and this one was just done about a week ago. And so the only difference between those two children was the hip dysplasia. So femoral lengthening is very, very difficult. Don't be greedy. Consider soft tissue releases at the same time, and beware of knee subluxation. This again is another old case. I haven't seen one of these since, but um, after a moderate femoral lengthening, he started to poster, have a posterior lateral rotation and subluxation of his right knee. And actually, he completely dislocated his kneecap. And you can see on the CT here. So I got healing. I took the frame off. Um, we tried actually, uh, something I forgot to tell the other groups, I tried actually to go across the knee and bring it back. I got the, the, the tibia realigned on the knee, but I could not budge that patella. So um, I waited till it was off, and I reconstructed his knee, and um, this was the final result which was, I think, better than um, I had expected. So to prevent joint instability, you're all familiar with this. Physical therapy, extend the frame across the joint, soft tissue releases, um, and probably the most important thing is avoid too much length. Femoral fractures, if you lengthen like this today, with no intermedullary fixation, you're going to get a fracture at least 25 to 30% of the time. So you either have to put in a nail at when you pull the frame off or lengthen over a nail or lengthen with an intermedullary nail. The more severe discrepancy is Gillespie BC or a Paley 1B or 2A. Um, this is a much greater discrepancy, up to 50% of the length of the femur. There are short, broad thigh segments. You've all seen this. Associated findings, exactly the same. So the factors here are a little bit different than just predicted discrepancy, right? It's what kind of hip do you have? What kind of foot do you have? And so if you have a foot that looks like this, you're going to be less likely to engage with significant reconstruction, even though that was a pretty functional foot, actually. So this example of a child, Paley 2A, there's a pseudarthrosis here, and you can see by this MR the significant varus. There's a pseudarthrosis there in the, um, um, in the uh, chondrophipsis, and then the significant deformity. And you can see that on the arthrogram. And so to achieve that image, the leg needs to be over here. Because the deformity is a varus, and then the femur sweeps posteriorly, retroverted, and then in this direction. And it's a very, very complex deformity. And this is it intra-op, showing the um, uh, the blade plate up the femoral neck and the shaft disappearing medially and distally and anteriorly. So here was the result. This fixation was not ideal. You can see a little halo around it. We reconstructed it, had a good alignment. And so this child um, has a predicted discrepancy of 20 centimeters, but with a good hip we should be able to achieve um, um, close to equality. And um, as you um, will see in, in, in Dr. Stevens' lecture in a few minutes, I think that, that there is an opportunity now to control the, um, the opposite leg 
um, and reduce the growth rate in that leg. So um, with very severe discrepancy, with a very unstable hip or a non-functional foot, an absent proximal femur, um, I am not reconstructing those. I don't, don't even consider it. Um, you can use a prosthesis. I haven't seen one of these in a long, long time. Um, but this was at our institution many years ago. And um, this is um, an example of a, um, you could do a Boyd or a Symes amputation and, and put the same leg into a prosthesis. You can fuse the knee and then do a Boyd or a Syme below. And the idea there is that this proximal segment with a short, short proximal femur is actually flexed with the knee close to the hip. And so if you fuse the knee out straight, this is a mobile hip, so the leg will straighten out. And it's a much um, more cosmetically appealing um, result, as you see in this young man. And um, if you've got a good foot, you can do a rotation plasty. Um, in comparison to, um, to tumor um, um, uh, reasons for doing a rotation plasty, derotation will occur with growth in these kids. Um, and so here's an example of a rotation plasty. Although this child, this one did not have a congenitally short femur, it was a tumor problem, I wanted to show you an example of an iliofemoral fusion I did. And so this is a rotated leg, so the, the knee becomes the hip in this circumstance, and you have active hip flexion using the gastrox and active foot motion. And so this can be a very effective um, limb. Um, and in a child with bilateral severe proximal femoral focal deficiency, um, you don't want to do anything that affects function. You want to treat this young lady so she's as functional and mobile as possible. Thank you.